Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, the minute Peter Pettit asked me to do this class, um, I thought to myself, I bet he knows more about C.S. Lewis than I do. I have to say, I don't teach C.S. Lewis very often. Uh, I team taught a course with my friend Jason Mond. Do you know Jason? He's also a St. Paul member, great guy. Um, and we team taught together The Great Divorce, which is the book that Peter has chosen for all of you to read this week. I will read passages from the book, so if you haven't found time to read it, you can be up to speed and you can... Um, the, the book is basically a catalog of people who are caught between heaven and hell, and they have every opportunity to go to heaven except their personalities stand in the way. They're incredibly irritating people, <laughs> as people can be. And um, uh, that's the, so I don't know if that sells the book or not, but that's uh, what this book is like. And I will read uh, irritating passages from the people um, in that book um, next week. And we'll discuss what it tells us about heaven and hell and what people are like. October 16th of 2022, there is a show that I understand many of you have signed up to go. So I'm only going to talk about some aspects of Lewis's life, and I'll leave the rest to the, the show, which is really going to be interesting, I think. There are a series of one-man shows, as they're called, uh, in which C.S. Lewis describes his conversion to Christianity. And um, one of them has been converted to this film. Or even if you just like C.S. Lewis uh, and find him so funny that you want more of it, you could watch this film because it really is um, quite good. Um, so those are two reasons that we're thinking about C.S. Lewis today. All right, so um, let's begin here. C.S. Lewis is an apologist. And what that means is that he tries to explain and justify Christianity to the world. Um, he's famous for his uh, writings. Uh, many uh, of his writings, as we'll see, are fantasy writings, and many of us uh, read, read those. Uh, possibly read them as kids. I didn't. My wife and I read the Narnia Chronicles the first time when we were traveling around the United States before we had kids, and we'd read them to each other. Um, because cars didn't have those fancy things in those days that they, that they do today. Uh, as I say here, Lewis converted to Christianity as a young professor after an education that had steeped him in materialism or rationalist atheism. We're going to talk about materialism today, but of course all it means basically is that there's nothing outside of the physical world. We are simply tissue, and the world is, the physical world is it, and there is no metaphysics, no God, no ideas beyond the physical world. And that was a, a belief structure that Lewis committed to when he was just a teenager. Just at, at 14 years old, he wrote um, uh, confessions of his adamant atheism. Um, he was an extraordinarily bright kid, as we will see. Um, and so how, did he, how does he escape this materialism and get into a world in which God has meaning? That's the story we're telling today, basically. So I'll review his journey from atheism to Christian discipleship and his membership in the Anglican Church. That was the church that he grew up in. Um, we'll review his schooling, some of which is shocking. We'll examine this materialism business. We'll meet some people that he knew, including, these names don't have to mean anything to, well, one of them probably should mean something to you, um, Hugo Dyson, Owen Barfield, and J.R.R. Tolkien, that's the one I have in mind. Um, many of you know Tolkien, right? If you're at all into fantasy literature, you've read The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. Um, that's not my stuff, so I don't really read that very much, but um, his association with those people um, often took place in a pub in Oxford, and the group was called the Inklings, as you know, and we'll meet them. And we'll chart Lewis's moves from atheism to theism to faith in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And then we'll review some of his major works, including The Great Divorce, which we have the chance to read together. Next week, as I said, we'll discuss Lewis's 1946 novel, The Great Divorce. Uh, I printed out study questions for the novel. I didn't write them myself. They come from the C.S. Lewis uh, Foundation site. And uh, those questions will give you an introduction to the series of irritating people on their way to heaven if they want it, but probably to hell. And you can see, uh, uh, we were thinking of using the St. Paul website, but actually that's a paper. Uh, this is a mistake. They're paper copies of the study questions. All right, so we begin the story here. September 28th. 1931. 
Um, Lewis, uh, by this time, and you'll learn this story, so um, I'm, I'm sort of starting at the end of the story here. Um, in September of 1931, Lewis got into the sidecar of a motorcycle with his brother at the, uh, on the motorcycle, his brother Warney, who was a, his deepest friend, his lifelong friend. And at that point, um, Lewis believe, he was a, uh, I think we'd call him a theist. He had come to believe that there was more than materialism, but he couldn't really believe in the God of the church. That didn't make sense to him. So he believed in uh, a capital A absolute that we'll get into, uh, uh, a proposal that he had learned from a philosopher named Hegel. So he, uh, he actually was attending church at the time. He said, I need to do that to plant my flag. That I, it says, I care about these matters. Um, but he was not what we would call a Christian yet, and he didn't feel, uh, he didn't have a prayerful relationship with Jesus. I think we could put it that way. Um, he gets on into the sidecar, um, not believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and they ride across the hills of central England to um, uh, the Whipsnade Zoo, of all things. And he said, by the time I got out of the sidecar, I was a Christian, and I believed that Jesus uh, was God's son. He said, I wasn't overwrought with emotion. I wasn't thinking deep thoughts. I wasn't pondering anything. I just made up my mind on that trip that Jesus was the son of God. This is why we love C.S. Lewis. I mean, apart from the fantasy writings that he writes that are, that are apologies for Christianity and help us to understand the nature of belief and unbelief, this is the reason that we like C.S. Lewis, because like us, he made up his mind that this all matters that uh, faith is where it's at. Faith is the only non-absurd thing we can do with our lives. Okay? So that's 1931. How did Lewis get to that moment in the sidecar? He explains it as a series of moves that God made, and he's pretty clever about this. He poses God in his writings, in, in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. He poses God as his enemy and his opponent, he, he believed, he resisted and resisted and resisted God's work on him, but he believed that God was determined to get him. And, and God had the moves to get him. That's the process that he believed happened. This is a little strange for someone like me because my parents had me going to Lutheran church since I was born. Uh, there was never a moment when I wasn't in the church. But, so I didn't have that conversion experience that he had. But for him, it was a decisive uh, moment in his life. Lewis says over and over again, he did not want to meet this God. He was deadly afraid this God was going to take everything away from him. Because if God is real, God can ask you for anything. And he was afraid of that. He thought that everything pleasant in his life, everything that he enjoyed, might get taken away from him. Turns out that didn't happen which maybe we would have predicted, I don't know. Okay, he was born in Belfast, Ireland in 1898, and that is actually his house, his father's house. Uh, his dad was, if I remember right, a grocery manager, uh, but in, in any case, he was a small businessman, and he made really good money so that when um, Lewis was just a very young boy, um, they moved into this house, and that uh, house shows up in the Narnia Chronicles and other books quite often. All those scenes, remember those scenes where the kids go into attics and closets and that sort of thing? That's based on this house. Uh, Lewis even said, I am a product of long corridors, empty sunlit rooms, upstairs indoor silences, attics explored in solitude, distant noises of gurgling cisterns and pipes, and the noise of wind under the tiles also of endless books. His father had the house just absolutely full of books, and he didn't limit the, the boys' reading at all. They could read anything they wanted, and they bit, basically picked up adult books at a young age, which made him a prodigious learner, as we will see in a couple of moments. Um, sometimes the houses um, in C.S. Lewis are pictured as old, drafty things. That wasn't the case. He was in a brand-new house um, exploring the attics, but that's okay. Okay, here's the family. Um, when Lewis was nine years old, his mother passed away. And that was a decisive and formative moment in his life, as it would be for any kid who loses his mom. Um, he had a deep sadness from that moment on in his life and a longing for connection 
that, that he felt he had lost. He was lucky, however, because his father was a very kind person. You can see how uh, affectionate he is with the boys here in this picture with his arm over. I think that's Warney. Um, Warren is uh, C.S. Lewis's Clive's brother. C.S. Lewis hated his name, by the way. He hated the name Clive. Um, everyone called him Jack or Jacksy because that was his dog's name, and he wanted to be called the dog's name. <laughs> it's true. Um, so when he was nine years old, he lost his mother, and, and so he bonded very strongly with both his father and his brother, Warney. Warren was called Warney then for the rest of his life. The only time the two of them were separated was during um, Warney's 20-year um, career in the military, from basically the beginning of the First World War um, into the 1930s when Warney was uh, a, an English uh, army officer. That's the only time the, 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 they were apart. In fact, at the end of their lives, they were sharing a house with Joy Davidman and the three of them living together. Lewis was bullied and abused in boarding school. At the age of, I think, just 10 or 11, his father sent him to England to go to boarding school. And he did it because he felt that this was going to be the best way to raise the kid um, with um, the proper attitude. And this attitude was not about being Christian. It was about um, acting like the upper crust in England, the elite. Because if you can act like those people, you have a ticket into the places they go, and that's much more pleasant than being in the working class. And it was m very important for Mr. Lewis that his boys um, attained these manners. And so they sent Lewis to boarding school. It's shocking. They would put the boy on a boat to cross the North Channel from Ireland to England. He would have to find his own way onto a train, take the train into central England, just north of London, and find his school. He did this all on his own as a young boy. Um, uh, that's just the way they were. Apparently, he crossed the Irish Channel something like 25 times in his childhood, all alone. It was just typical in those days. Not, not helicopter parents, uh, <laughs> you can see. But there's a sad, sad part of this story, and it, it goes like this. One of Lewis's first teachers uh, was later declared insane, and he was incredibly abusive. There's a story of him one time uh, taking a paddle and not only paddling the boys, but running across the room to get up steam to hit them. I mean, it's incredible what, uh, what these boys went through. And Lewis dealt with it quite well. He, he said he learned, uh, he learned how to endure suffering, but more importantly, he learned in that school how to have hope. He had hope that he could get out of there, and one day he did get out of there. When he was about 13... His brother, how does this go? His brother was caught smoking in the school that they were in together and got kicked out and, had, and was improved by getting a tutor who was really rough on him, an individual personal tutor. And, and uh, C.S. Lewis's father decided, well, if the tutor is that good with my older son, he'll be bit good with my younger son too. And so he sent Clive to, to this individual tutor who comes into the story next. Um, W.T. Kirkpatrick, um, whom the Lewis brothers called the Great Knock, I don't know why, um, and his wife Louise were the tutor. Um, this person is an extremely learned person in the classical languages, and he said that at the age of 15, Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis was the best translator of Latin and Greek that he'd ever met. He, he was that smart. And I don't know if you know this, but in those days, around the turn of the century, um, you, were, you would be trained for a life in English business by getting a Latin and Greek degree. The classical languages were thought the, the best way to prepare someone for a life of, uh, uh, you know, rational service. Lewis was one of the best translators of Latin and Greek that Kirkpatrick had ever seen. He was a happy kid, free from bullies now and tutored by a man who taught him rigor and honesty. Um, so much rigor that, that, that Kirkpatrick was determined, no matter what the boys said, if it was at all incorrect, whether at dinner or walking across the pasture or whatever, he corrected them. He made them defend their ideas. It was an incredibly rigorous education. But Lewis didn't mind that at all. In fact, he loved his, his daily routine, which, if I can remember right, goes something like this. He would get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, have a big breakfast prepared for him by Louise, and then he would sit down and work, reading and writing for about three or four hours. 
until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Then lunch was served. And then he would go out into the woods. He would go out walking through the afternoon. One of his favorite walks, it's, it's a time when he discovered one of the most important books in his life. He took a walk, I think it's three miles to the neighboring train station, and then he would get on the train and ride back. That was one of his favorite walks each day. And when he did that, he found a used book by a guy named McDonald, who um, ends up being his guide through hell, well, purgatory, in The Great Divorce, as we'll see next week. He just fell in love. With, this guy, McDonald, wrote fantasy literature, and this is how Lewis fell in love with fantasy literature. He discovered this book in the train station in one of his walks. But anyway, to continue these days that he absolutely adored, he worked hard all morning, he had lunch, he took a long walk in the afternoon. Tea was served at four, and he expected cake with his tea. That was part of his delight, he tells us. And then he would work again for hours until eight o'clock dinner time. Dinner time then meant socializing with the rest of the family until 11 and start over the next day. He loved that routine. He's a bit like me. My motto has always been, maybe if I'm good, they'll leave me alone. <laughs> and that's how he uh, saw his life, too. Uh, they never leave you alone. <laughs> um, both Lewis and Kirkpatrick were atheists. Uh, they regarded the sciences as the last word on human nature. Only physical things exist, no metaphysics. People have evolved from lower forms. Our brain activity is a natural accident, and we live alone in a huge, cold universe. That's what Lewis believed in at age 14. He'd a lot, he felt there was a great blasphemy that year because his dad wanted to be, get confirmed in the Anglican Church in Ireland, the, the English Protestant Church, and he agreed to do that, and he thought that was a great blasphemy because he didn't believe in any God at that time. Uh, he served in the Great War. It was then called the Great War. We call it World War I because we had a second world war to deal with. He um, was shipped over in 1918, the last year of the war. He was shipped to France, and he um, became ill. He had trench fever, um, uh, an infection of some kind. He had trench fever and was hospitalized for a number of months, then recovered, went back into the trenches, and was wounded. He was out, between the, the, out in the no man's land between the lines, and I, I believe he was hit by a fragment of some kind and wounded. And he was lucky. It was, one of, it was called a blighty in those days, a blighty wound, because it sent you back to England, which had the nickname blighty. The men called England or home, they called it blighty. So if you got a blighty wound, that was the, the best kind because it sent you home, but it didn't disable you or harm you permanently. And he got that kind of wound. Uh, so he served honorably uh, in, in the war. Then, happy accident, he ends up going to Oxford University. He, like me, was really bad at math uh, and good at a lot of other things. And he couldn't get into Oxford. But that year, they dropped the ordinary requirements for veterans. And he got in. And we would not know C.S. Lewis if that accident had not happened. But he, so he had his math scores waived, and he was admitted into Oxford. And then, of course, he proved himself an absolutely magnificent student. Now, in the US, what we do is you, you complete four years of college. And then if you, want to get, uh, if you want to become a professor, you go on to earn sometimes your master's degree and your PhD. You can earn just your PhD without the master's. But um, it's extra schooling. That's not the case in, in the UK, or it wasn't in Lewis's day. Um, you became a professor by doing a regular undergraduate degree, but just doing it much better than the other students. You just read a lot more. And that's what it means to get a first. And he got a first in three separate disciplines. The first two he earned um, on schedule, but he couldn't get a job with it. So he went back to his father and he said, could I have another year of university? And his father said, yes, you can. And so he earned a first then in English. Uh, his previous firsts had been in classical languages. So that meant that he was uh, able to become a professor and he was hired as a tutor. They're called tutors in England because um, you do give lectures, uh, voluntary lectures that the students can come to or not, depending, but they, all they, they, they come to the lectures voluntarily because all they have to do is pass a big written exam at the end of the semester. Uh, it was like that in Norway when I taught there, too. It was very pleasant. It was fun. It was a lot less work for the professor. Um, you just stood in front of people and spouted off like I am today, which is a lot of fun. Uh, he um, 
but, and then, but then you're called a tutor because students come in two at a time into your office and they read papers to you every week showing what they read that week and that they've grappled with that reading. And they do it on their own. You just have to listen and, and give feedback to what the, they say. So that's what his career was like in, in, a, as a young professor at Oxford. Uh, it looks like Magdalen College, but it's pronounced Maudlin. You have to know that. Okay, so Lewis began to confront his materialism. Between 1925, when he became a fellow at Oxford, and 1931, God was working on him, he believed, and he became a Christian. You can become a Christian by being a professor? That seems unlikely, doesn't it? When he was still a teenager, he fell in love with books by Christian writers who seemed good to him in spite of their Christianity. He had to overlook their Christianity because he liked them so much as writers. And one was George MacDonald, that fantasy writer whose book he found in the train station. The other was G.K. Chesterton, who writes these funny mysteries about um, Father Brown. The Father Brown TV show is based on Chesterton's books. Okay. Um, and he found these guys extremely reasonable, but baffling because they were Christians. So that was God's first move in getting to him. Uh, then in 1925, an atheist friend of his, also on the Oxford faculty, began to believe in the historicity of the gospel, saying that Jesus really was a so-called dying God. Now, this is a weird moment, so I've got to try to explain it. Lewis, at this time, was uh, very much drawn to fantasy literature. He loved the Norse sagas, and he loved um, you know, the classical myths. And every time he would read a story about a God making a sacrifice on behalf of humanity, he would be deeply moved by that. It, it sounded right to him. It made human sense to him. But when he would read the Gospels and read about Jesus making this great sacrifice on our behalf, it just didn't ring true. It just didn't move him. It moved him, but it didn't seem right. And one day, an atheist friend of his came up to him and said, eh, it's a rum thing. I don't like it. But it looks like historically Jesus really did live. He really was wrongly arrested, he really was punished, and he really was killed by the Romans. And that leaves the resurrection alone, but, but what this guy was saying to him is, um, the Jesus story isn't a myth like the other ones that you enjoy. It really happened, okay? And, and that was a decisive moment for, for Lewis. Lewis began to realize that materialism was simply an argument of the materialist mind, of atoms bouncing around inside the skull. So I've got to try and see if I can explain that, too. He was saying, he said, okay, if our minds are just accidental products of evolution, and we know that they're bundles of nonsense, um, we have psychological drives, we have dreams, we have wishes, we have irrational um, traits, but also the ability to think very clearly and with great creativity. So the mind is a really weird thing. He said, why in the world would I trust that brain to absolutely tell me that there's only a material universe? That conclusion is the conclusion of a very faulty looking organ. Okay? So he said, I can't trust my mind to draw that kind of firm, decisive conclusion for the rest of my existence. So that was move number two toward theism. Then he, he read Hegel, and he began to, to believe in an absolute that Hegel says. It goes something like this. Kierkegaard was interested in Hegel, too. He had to he counter-argued Hegel, but it goes something like this. Hegel said, a lot of people become religious. But the reason they become religious is because they have this deep need to get to something universal and absolute. The thing about religion is, in Hegel's view, it's childishness. It's silliness. So what you need to do is to get beyond religion into this absolute, which is actually a function of philosophy, not religion. It's perfectly rational, according to Hegel. And both Kierkegaard and, and C.S. Lewis said, wait a minute. That move isn't required, but that doesn't happen yet. For now, that's exactly what um, C.S. Lewis believes. So he's now kind of a philosophical deist. He believes in the existence of something outside the physical world, but he doesn't yet say that it's God and God's Son and the Holy Spirit. He's not ready to say that yet. Later, he decides 
<laughs> he's, he's actually on a, well, yeah, let me tell the story this way. Later he decides that God is the absolute. He had to call that God spirit, and he makes a joke about this in the show that you're going to see. But he denies God's activity or Christ's resurrection. So he's then accepted theism. And here's how it happened. One summer day in 1929, he got on one of those beautiful double-decker buses in Oxford, and he said he just had a funny feeling. He felt like he was buckled up in armor, and he was resisting something really hard, and it suddenly occurred to him, you know what, I can unbuckle this armor. I can just unbuckle it and see what happens. And so he let his defenses down, and he said, whatever happens next, happens. So that was the next step in what happened to C.S. Lewis. He began around this time to, he was lucky, he had a lot of really good Christian professor friends. And he started listening to people like Hugo Dyson, Owen Barfield, and Tolkien, who told him that the Christian story was a myth, uh, like others that Lewis loved, but crucially different because it really happened. Now, I told you that story before, but here it falls into place. This is where it happened. And suddenly he's beginning to say, wait a minute. Maybe, this Christ, maybe the Gospels are historically accurate. Maybe I can believe them. And then it happened on that September day in 1931 when we, we Warney and Jack, set out by motorcycle to the Whipsnade Zoo. I did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. And he doesn't try to explain it very carefully. You know, there's a, there's a theological um, difference that many of us fight over. I've belonged to churches that once lost half their congregation over this question. The question is, do we come to God? Do we seek God and find God? Or are we weak enough that God has to come and find us? And he finesses that question. He won't say. He says, I, I feel like it was God working on me, but I did make up my mind when it happened, when the opportunity happened. And so he finesses it. He won't really get into that central distinction about whether God comes to us or we come to God. I'm certainly not going to try to answer that question. <laughs> By the way, would the pastors now leave the room? Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, maybe I do. Lewis disliked church. Uh, he especially disliked the announcements. And he... <laughs> He thought that hymns were fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. <laughs> but he went to church. He went to church because he, he recognized, as we do, that it's really important to belong to a community of believers. That the only way we're going to learn to love each other properly is to be with each other. And that worship is a marvelous opportunity. If you really want to love God, you've got to worship God, too. And that's something we do together. It's not something we do in private. So C.S. Lewis, again, he says he stuck his flag in the ground. He said, I'm going to church because that's what believers do. Even if he didn't like every bit of it. He teaches us what our pastors teach us, which is something like this. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose but to turn us into little Christs. After he became a believer, um, C.S. Lewis formed a, a writer's club called the Inklings, and they met in a bar. Um, the eagle and child, which they had a nickname for. What is it? The, some, the bird and the baby, they called it. The bird and the baby, the eagle and child. It is now closed as a pub and being turned into a, a hotel, a tourist hotel, which is sad. But uh, I, to me, at least, sad. I haven't seen it. I haven't visited the place. But um, uh, he and a group of professor friends, including Tolkien, later became the Inklings. His brother Warney was one of these people. Owen Barfield, the philosopher, was one of these people. And they would come together and have a pint, and one of them, or more than one, would read the latest chapter of a book they were working on, or an essay, or a poem, and the others were ruthless in um, answering back like whether this was any good in their view or not. And they helped each other to become better writers. So that's the Inklings. 
And Lewis then became the most popular Christian apologist, writing books like Mere Christianity, the Narnia Chronicles, the Screwtape Letters, in which um, the devil and his assistant discuss how to defeat human goodness, and then The Great Divorce, which we have a chance to read this week and discuss next week, um, and I've described for you. Um, the story that I just told you, as many of you probably know, is available to you in a book called Surprised by Joy. That's his spiritual autobiography in which he basically explains everything that I just explained to you. I was mostly picking up my information from this book by Devin Brown, um, C.S. Lewis, A Spiritual Biography, A Life Observed, Obser observed uh, which I found really, I was really glad to have this opportunity to, to work up material on Lewis because I didn't know this story very well and it was really an opportunity to learn it. Well, I think it is time to, 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 to end this, so thank you very much for your attention.